this evening we have to bring to a conclusion our study of the bodies of man and therefore we want to aspire at least to a rather broad survey of this subject. We have already mentioned casually in passing uh, that the bodies of man correspond in the Indian philosophy to the corresponding bodies of the earth or to the various fields of substances from which the bodies of man gain their materials and from which they are compounded in order that they may sustain the vital principle that gathers them on their proper and respective planes. In this regard, therefore, uh, we are taught at least by some of the Indian schools that the bodies of the earth corresponding to those of man extend through the physical upward to the monastic field or the plane of mind and that that level or body of the earth which corresponds to the mental body of man is the highest earth vehicle and that therefore from the substances of the earth and its various superphysical strata these bodies are built and that any person or being that enters into the monastic field or into the plane of mind or mind substance becomes inevitably drawn to the earth and becomes immersed in the earth materials therefore technically the term world or earth as used in ancient philosophy signifies not only the planet physically but these fields up to and inclusive, inclusive of the mental body. Together these form the sphere of mortality and it is in the monastic field that the human ego or the principle of self-existence uh, is generated and is maintained. Thus the existence of the self as a personal being corresponds to the involvement of spiritual energy in a material condition. And with, if we include under the term material everything from mental substance through emotional substance, vital substance, and material substance, these four substances become the spokes of the mysterious St. Andrew's Cross of antiquity upon which the dove of Ixion or the dove of Samaramus, uh, the sole symbol, was crucified. Thus the cross of body, uh, which the Logos must bear, is composed of the four bodies, and these in turn are reflected downward into the four etheric fields to become the four elements. This picture gives us a certain grasp of the relationship of man uh, to his world according to ancient belief. Now in this the great scheme of things. The world or the earth, therefore, is represented in many mythological systems uh, as a kind of surface in the midst of which rises a boss like the boss of the shield of Achilles. And this boss is the mountain Miru, the abode of the gods. And this extends upward like the Asgard of ancient Nordic mythology or the Olympus of the Greeks until its upper crest, the abode of the terrestrial deities, uh, touches and pierces the mysterious sky that leads on upward into space, pointing with eternal finger to the constellation of the little bear. This concept of the world mountain rising in the midst of matter, of course, represents the gradual growth and development of man's vehicles until the mundane God, which is himself, the ego, resides in the highest part of the world, which is the mountain Miru, or the ancient Hindu peak Kalasa. And here, the deity, surrounded by his godlings and attendants, exercises sovereignty over the material world and all the creatures that inhabits, that inhabit this sphere. Now, in the ancient symbolism also, this is the key to the story of Jonah and the whale. 
because Jonah, of course, representing Iona, the dove, or the soul, is cast over from the ship for disobedience to the word of God, another form of the fall of man legend, and falling into the sea is swallowed by the great fish. The great fish, of course, represents the mundane universe, extending from the mental sphere down to the material. And once the soul is held within this, it must remain the three symbolic days, symbol symbolical of birth, death, and resurrection, or the three degrees of the mysteries, before it can gain liberation and return to fulfill its mission of preaching to the people of Nineveh. We have many similar symbols, and another that stands out for us at the moment is the work of the initiated poet Aeschylus, who in his wonderful poem, Prometheus Bound, describes the being that is bound in chains to the peak of Mount Caucasus with a vulture placed above his liver. Prometheus, the provider, the provincial or the providential one, the one who was sent, who brought mankind fire in a hollow reed, was punished for his audacity by being bound to the peak of this mountain, from which he was finally rescued by Hercules, who of course becomes the symbol of the solar messiah. All these legends and stories have to do, therefore, not only with the abstractions of cosmogony, but also with the development and generation of man. And a recent Indian author, in his study of the Vedic gods, explains to us that all these deities have their correspondences in the visible or invisible parts of man's constitution, that they represent principles within him, the discovery and understanding of which will provide him with the necessary keys, not only to the unfolding of scriptural writings, but also to the regeneration of himself. All of this brings us then to the next step in our problem. We can recognize in Indian philosophy these four bodies or rupas uh, forming a kind of chalice or cup uh, called the cup of Lethe and those who drink of it forget forever their divine origin. This cup, or crater, which receives into itself the blood of space, is also the Eucharistic cup and the cup of Gethsemane. It is the symbol of the involvement of life and form, and Christ asks that this cup be allowed to pass from him, but if not, the will of the Father be done, by means of which he implied death. And death was the ancient symbol of involvement in matter, for that is death which is buried within the mystery of body. Resurrection is therefore the restoration of the psychic or spiritual life of man from involvement in the chain of vehicles which constitute his personality and which arise from the seat of individuality within his mental nature. Now if each of the planets then is said to have these bodies extending upward to the Arupa Manas. These planets also have their existence within the great field of the sun. And here we have the second part of our Indian philosophy. According to these people, the sun contains within its power three tremendous spheres or orders of energy spiritual life or being. And these are called in Indian philosophy uh, the Atma, the Buddhi, and the Manas. The highest of these fields is the field of pure life itself, the Atma, from which we have our word Atme, meaning superior, or that which is best. We also realize that of these three fields, the lowest, or the monastic field, becomes the theater of lesser development. Therefore, the unfoldment of planets takes place in the third, or monastic field, of the body of the Logos. And within this field, uh, which is the beginning of embodiment, all of the lesser vehicles are gradually individualized. The monastic field, then, is the third power of the Logos, or the third person, of the great trinity of energies. And uh, in the ancient triad of consciousness, intelligence, and force, the monastic field represents the principle of force. If 
Therefore, it be said that each of the planets only has certain vehicles or bodies attending, ascending to the monastic field, the sun, or the solar power itself, the Logos, has the remaining vehicles which, make ne which are necessary to complete the great septenary. Thus, in the ancient mythology, uh, the higher vehicles of deity, or the higher bodies, Acne and Buddha, or and Buddha, are not peculiar to a planet, but constitute the common field of all planets. These, therefore, are a substance permeating uh, individualized planetary evolutionary systems. And in the case of man, his, uh, his monastic principle, his ego, is individualized. But if he transcends this or goes above it to a higher state of being, he is no longer within the sphere of body. Therefore, he passes into the collective psychic energy of the sun. Thus, man may have mental bodies individualized, but all men have the buddhic sheath in common. In other words, we are now transcended the limitation of form, and we enter into the great field of life. To understand this perhaps a little better, I will try to make use of the famous symbolism used by the Egyptians, who described the universe by showing a transverse section of an onion. This uh, represented a series of concentric rings, and in this system, Atme, or Atma, the supreme principle, is not in the center, but at the circumference. And the rings, as in the stories of the Kabbalah, diminish toward the center, forming a concatenation, like the uh, rings of a bullseye target. The outer one, Atma, contains them all, and corresponds in man to the principle of the auric age, or the final vehicle which contains all others. Buddhi is within this, and represents the great intuitional power of the Logos. Within this is the third, or monastic field, the world mind, within which gradually individualizes under the power of the so-called cosmocrator, or the Zeus, the third power of deity, the mundane world and its diffusion comes into existence. Thus, each world contains all lesser than itself and is contained in that which is superior to itself. Each of the planets with their vehicles, therefore, are suspended in the midst of this outer circle of bodies, which encloses them all, and in which they have a common sharing. Man, therefore, cannot actually build an individual or personal buddhi sheep or vehicle, because the very principle of buddhi, or soul illumination, corresponds not to an individual attainment, but a man reaching out toward universal re-identification. Thus, Buddha represents, to a degree, the experience of cosmic consciousness, because in comparison to the planetary bodies, it is a cosmic body. More correctly, it is a solar body. Those who have attained it, therefore, are the sun heroes, or the solar men, the divine men and the immortal mortals. They correspond to the concept of the demigod, whose position is between heaven and earth. In the uh, same symbolism, it is taught that from the principle of higher manas, or the higher mind, a bridge is built, a bridge upward, towards that which is superior to itself, the experience of Buddha. This bridge has been variously named and indicated, but it represents, of course, the seat of the universal soul in man, just as surely as his emotional nature represents the seat of the human soul. The universal or world soul is the Prometheus. It is also the Christos. It is the being which dies for the sin of the world. It is the symbol of illumination, which gives of itself for the redemption of the darkness below it. Therefore, Buddhi always represents, in the study of man, a luminous over-principle, a principle to which attunement or adjustment must be made by the powerful extension of the mind upward toward 
an experience beyond its own nature. Actually, the mind can never grasp the Buddhic principle for the reason that we have told you before. No vehicle or no instrument can attain to the full comprehension of that which is superior to itself. Thus, as Buddhi represents also a paradisical world, a heavenly sphere beyond the state of mortal man, it is inevitable that mortal man cannot enter into it and can experience it only in one of two ways. First, by the transcending of his own intellect, and secondly, by what is called in Christian theology the act of grace, or the descent of the Buddhic principle itself through its adepts, ahats, and messiahs. This uh, relationship then means that the search for Buddhi as an experience within the life of man is the search for the universal within and behind the particular of human experience. The Indian philosophers tell us definitely that the only road that can possibly lead to Buddhi is a road inward, that man can never discover it around him or in space, but he can experience it within him at the root and substance of his own being. Uh, the principle of manas or mind, particularly the egoic vortex of selfhood, represents, so to say, the tiny uh, bridge or the tiny isthmus which connects the upper and lower halves of an hourglass. It represents the constriction between an upper and lower state. Man ascending to the mind therefore ascends to a focal point, and from this point, if he continues to rise, he expands as a being toward the universal. And this expansion from the particular, from the individual, to that which is the root of individuality, and transcends it, is called the mystical experience. Now, in uh, Indian philosophy, the mystical experience always represents through samadhi, or through one of its various terms and names, man's momentary apperception of the eternal. We therefore have to understand a little bit about the nature and structure of Buddhi in order to estimate uh, the meaning of the experience and also the understanding of its relationship to Buddha, the man who is said to have been one of those who attained to this state of liberation. The nirvana is then, of course, actually man's release from the state of mental individuality, his ascent beyond the condition of selfhood towards that which is a universal nature or being. It is an ascent from the condition of a planet to the state of a sun. Now, what is the essential difference between a planet and a sun? The essential difference in the Greek and Egyptian and Indian philosophy is that a sun is a giver of life, and a planet is an acceptor of life. Man, therefore, living in the four bodies uh, which he has come to at least abstractly recognize, is a receiver of life. Into him pours the energy of the universe. Through him is distributed the vitality of the sun, the moon, and the planets. Also through him pours the radiance and power of his own mental existence, the power of mind, the power of individual selfhood, which he has come to regard so highly. But man, for his sustaining and for his perpetuation, is forever dependent upon the world around him. He is dependent upon nature for the physical necessities of life. He is dependent upon the psychological structure of the planet, for the psychological sustenance which he needs for his survival. And he is dependent upon the mind of the planet, for the substances from which his own mental nature are generated. He is therefore forever a recipient, receiving, like the planets, from the sovereign bounty of the sun itself. The sun, however, is not a recipient, it is a bestower. And it is the spiritual duty, according to the ancients of all men, to gradually change psychologically from planets to suns. They must change from the state of receiving, from the state of dependence, to the state of giving, by means of which 
their own luminous light becomes the supporting power of other creatures. This great evolutionary motion, therefore, which they recognize, ends in sonship, either S-O-N or S-U-N, both of which have identically the same essential meaning, that they shall become uh, radiant centers of life power. Now in uh, the Vedas and in the sacred writings, particularly the Rig Veda, which is the earliest, and therefore deals with the worship of elements and prayers to the sun, the moon, and the stars. In these ancient writings, uh, the power of the sun was not regarded as being directed upon any group, class, or kind. The sun warmed all equally. The sun had brought forth the grass from the earth, and it brought forth the life of man. The sun is forever bountiful, forever bestowing, nor does it hold its gifts, nor reserve them for any favored few. It is the universal benefactor. Therefore, man attending to attaining to sonship attains to the condition of the universal benefactor. Considering no longer any of the limitations imposed by Manus, he must achieve to the state of consciousness which is represented by Buddhi itself. And this state of consciousness is that of eternal diffusion of soul power. Thus the person, the being, unable naturally to completely disentangle itself from matter, and being to a degree bound uh, by the laws of physical generation, cannot become identical with Buddhi or the world soul. He can, however, become receptive and responsive to its power. As long as his bodies remain, he must assume a receptive attitude and thereby allow the world soul to move through him because he is part of the vehicles that survive only through receptivity, through acceptance to their own natures. And he has, however, the power not only to accept, but to disseminate, uh, to radiate, to release through his nature these powers uh, which the universe allows to move into him and through him in the course of manifestation. The purificatory rites, therefore, of the ancient mysteries, Eastern and Western, were intended to cleanse the inside of the cup, to make the bodies of man suitable to be the channels of Buddhi. And just as in the Indian system the avatars, or the embodiments of God, take form and manifest in the world, so Buddhi, moving into manifestation through his purified disciples or instruments, is said to take form and to become incarnate in a regenerated creature who by, by this reason and circumstance uh, becomes a disciple or an instrument uh, for the revelation of the messianic mystery. Thus in Christendom we also have this principle of Buddhi or the world soul, the one and first begotten of the Father, representing not only illumination as such, grace as such, but also embodying uh, another attribute with which the ancients most frequently uh, endowed it. And that attribute was the beautiful. Thus the principle of pure beauty is Buddhi. The principle of uncontaminated beauty. The principle of absolute order, therefore, absolute perfection, absolute harmony and rhythm, absolute harmonious motion, and absolute harmonious sound. All of these attributes are related to Buddhi and represent uh, the emergence or the manifestation of the ecstasy of beauty, which has always been associated with the rites and rituals of the messianic tradition. Thus man becomes a channel for the pure beauty of God. And this pure beauty is a mysterious condition or substance because the ancients regarded beauty not merely as a state, but as an energy, but as a principle and a power in life. For they refused to accept that anything which was of itself lifeless could produce life or change life. Beauty can produce life, and it does change life. Therefore, it must itself have a natural energy or power. It must be, as they called it, a blessed God. 
ruling with God over the universe. In the study of the Eastern philosophies, therefore, uh, the essential ascent of man from the field of the monastic intellect uh, to the Buddhic principle was through a series of projections or extensions of self. And these extensions of self were really not man forcing his way upward, but man achieving a peculiar kind of ascent through receptivity. In other words, he could not climb this rocky crest of Mount Caucasus where the crucified sun god awaited uh, his deliverer. He was only able uh, to become still within his own monastic field and experience the proximity of Buddha. He experienced this as the great peace or the magnificent realization as a tremendous flowing of a water of light through himself. Therefore, Buddhi was also called the ocean which is above the firmament. This is the Shamayam of the ancient Kabbalists, the crystal sea of revelation that spreads out at the foot of the divine throne. It is also the source of the fountains, and it is also the root of the mysterious tree that bears the twelve manner of fruit, which is for the healing of the nations. Buddhi is therefore the root of the God goodness which man experiences in his own ascent toward a more spiritualized state. In our Western life, we have great difficulty in trying to define or understand what might be termed a spiritual state for man. Uh, we think of heaven more or less as a place, as a, an abode of rewards, as a kind of blessed continuance in a state not different essentially from the one we know here. The East does not have quite this concept of it. To them, Buddhi is not a participation in a place. Buddhi is, a, is an experience of the omnipresence, omniscience, and omniactivity of the Creator. It is something which moves in upon man as a transcendent mood something by which suddenly and indescribably he becomes aware of the sublimity of the great world that lies above and beyond him, the world which is the footstool of the eternal sun. Uh, we find uh, Plotinus describing this problem in those moments in which, as he says, he had the experience of existing in the presence of a blessed God. These moments, the mystical experience of Havelock Ellis, these moments of transcendence seem to be man's promise, man's glimpse of the promised land of reality beyond him, the land to which he must sometime come, the Canaan of the redeemed. All of this undoubtedly contributed to the ancient discipline systems by which man sought to achieve a, a union or identity with the Buddhic power which enveloped him and within which he truly lived and moved and had his being. If then mind becomes capable of the knowledge of the good, which is its final experience, that which is above, within, and behind man, mind becomes capable of the experience of the beautiful that is, of actual participation in pure sublimity. This pure sublimity is naturally beyond definition. We cannot tell what it is. We only know, as the Greeks said, that we languish for lack of it. We only know that because we do not have it, we are less than we would be. Therefore, that this something, this additional power, is that which breaks for man the mysterious iron shell of mind and permits him to escape into a larger and more glorious existence. Now the ancients tell us that due to the constitution of man and the peculiar way in which he is created, he is not able to extend across more than four conditions of substance at a time. Therefore, as he now extends from the physical through the vital and emotional and to the mental, 
This constitutes the complete gamut or the cross upon which his soul is crucified. If then he would go on and attain to something superior to this, he must then lose or discontinue the lower vehicle. In other words, before he could live or polarize himself completely in the Buddhic state, he must transcend the physical form. That is the reason why in the story of Buddha, it is definitely and clearly stated that the Mahaparanavana, or the great release, is only possible at the moment of death, because at that time and that time only man casts off the physical body. In the symbolism, of course, it is also taught that there are beings invisible to man who do not have bodies as we have them, and therefore are capable of a larger and fuller manifestation in the Buddhist state. Hierarchies and orders of beings called by St. Paul, thrones, powers, dominions, principalities, angels and archangels, therefore represent the creatures on the various rungs of the mysterious ladder of Jacob, the ladder which extends from the lower worlds to the throne of the deity. In the story of Buddhi, then, for man, we realize that all evolution actually is toward Buddhi, even as all involution is away from Buddhi. All evolution is a motion toward the universal. Growth is always enlargement, either quantitative or qualitative. Growth of mind is the increase of mind. Growth of emotions is the enrichment of emotion. Growth of body is the extension of its powers and faculties. Always, therefore, evolution is a motion from limitation toward freedom. And in this great evolutionary motion which takes place in nature, this motion leads first from the material structure of man, upward and inward, uh, through his vital emotional and mental natures, until finally he achieves the state of manas, or the state of man, which is an harmonious adjustment with the mental principle. Now, this is a bit optimistic because on that basis we're not evolving quite as fast as we think we are. Actually, the word man implies that man is master of mind, whereas in practical experience the mind is usually master of the man. Instead of being able to control the mind or unfold its resources towards its essential purpose, man has become a servant of his own mental-emotional complex and has therefore defeated uh, the final victory which he is supposed to attain. Having made this somewhat serious error, man surrounds himself with the products of his own mistake. He therefore falls into a state of misery, misfortune, suffering, and comes under the dominion of the hindrances, as they are called by Buddha. All of these represent the, the, the punishments for the misuse of mental energy, and this misuse may extend into the arts and sciences and philosophies and religions. Wherever there is misuse, there is punishment. And this punishment is not inflicted by an arbitrary divinity because the natural result of any activity is resident within the action itself. Therefore, nature simply punishes uh, by consequences, by the natural and inevitable reaction of action. Man having theoretically, however, by evolution, attained union with the mental principle, reaches the greatest degree of self-existence. On this level of self-existence, he must make the determinations by which his future destiny will be governed. In the Eastern systems as well as in the ancient systems, man attaining to the state of mind must then survey his world, survey his universe, examine outwardly and inwardly, and bring all things knowable to man under the dominion of man. And in this dominion there must be neither tyranny nor autocracy, neither abuse or misuse, for dominion in nature means always righteous rulership. And these things must occur, as is said in the book of Ruth, when the judges judged. This 
a constant judgment by the mind is also the process described on the threshing floor. It is the dividing of the wheat from the chaff. It is the division of the sheep from the goats. It is man gradually coming to the right decision of that which is proper, necessary, and useful for man. This decision, when attained, results in the life of virtue. And without the life of virtue, man cannot proceed any further in his quest for the older self. Always, therefore, each vehicle must be mastered before man can pass on to the next. And this is one of the difficulties that we have so often in religion, particularly in some of our more so-called progressive religious movements. The failure to realize that growth is through mastery and not through escape. That the individual cannot transcend any vehicle, power, principle, or energy within himself, except through mastery. Now, we do not mean by mastery any uh, mystical or mysterious term. We mean the simple problem of attaining to the right use of an energy, a power, or a faculty. For liberation always results from right use, from the fulfillment of the need or quality or condition implied by the faculty or energy. Therefore, to use correctly means to understand perfectly. And to understand and to use means to escape from the tyranny of that force or the limitation which that power might otherwise uh, bestow. All limitation results from the failure of the mind to control the energy. Anything that is unknown to man is his master. Anything that is known to man particularly known by the experience of consciousness, man is free from, and therefore is no longer in bondage to. Thus man rising through the kingdoms of nature, from the mineral, the vegetable, the animal, and the human, uh, ascends by the evolution of adjustment. He ascends by outgrowing, by achieving perfect harmony, and then extending beyond. And no one can extend beyond anything truly and completely unless that thing is first met, mastered, and understood. Therefore, in the growth of bodies, man seeking a higher state for himself cannot attain it until each of the lesser vehicles has enacted its toll. When this thou, the goddess, descended through the seven gates to visit Tammuz, in the underworld. The keeper of each gate stopped her and took something from her. And if this was the price or the payment of going on, in the Egyptian rituals the same was told, that those who passed through the various gates had to give something in order to continue on in their journey towards the Elysian fields. These gifts, this symbol of something that must be achieved or attained, always represents man's harmonious growth. It means that the individual uh, has proved his merit by mastery. He proves his merit over his own emotions by mastering hate, fear, grief, worry. He proves mastery over his body by making it his useful servant, well treated but not humorous. He proves mastery over his mind by dedicating the powers of the mind to the end for which they were intended, that end being the common improvement of mankind. Thus, by right use, man gains the mysterious payment which he must pay or give as he passes on into the next sphere of life. The old Christians, for instance, battered a coin with the dead to pay that the fare of the deceased across the river. Each individual must go, not empty-handed, into the next state of being, but supplied with the currency of that realm, which in each case is the currency of mastery, of adjustment, of ordered and integrated relationship with the principle involved. Of evolution is man's gradual mastery of himself. 
birth symbolically through the mastery of environment. But the mastery of environment is not enough. For the man who conquers himself is greater than he that takes the city. So all the way along, the bodies can only be uh, transcended by the individual who understands them completely. For as long as mystery remains, man is the servant of mystery. And while he is the servant of mystery, he is a little mad. Thus to attain final union with the mental principle or to preserve or achieve the evolutionary apex of manas, the individual must have conquered all other lower vehicles than mind and have brought them into harmony with the purposes of enlightened mind. If he has achieved this, he is properly turned sophos, or the wise. For wisdom is not a state of knowledge, but a state of achievement. Now, wisdom is more than learning, it is understanding. And understanding is that which results from the living experience of the fact. We have forgotten this in education. We have forgotten this in the policy of knowing that we have today. And as a result of that, we are producing schooled and educated persons who are still without understanding of themselves, the reason for themselves, or the world in which they live. Manus, having finally achieved its purpose, glorified and perfected mind, becomes, so to say, an appropriate symbol of the Demiurgus, or the third power of deity. For the mind of the intellect of the world is the third logos. And this power is the mysterious leader, the sage, the ancient Merlin, the archetypal principle of the wise man, the universal Plato, the universal Socrates. Thus mind in its highest aspect becomes the true philosopher, the true master of reason who has discovered not only the power to control the reasoning faculties, but the reason why they should all be dedicated to the service of universal good. This mind born, this mind perfected being, this monastic creature, having fulfilled all that is less, having attained through discipline, through understanding, through learning, through growth, uh, to a complete synthesis of the mental principle, then stands vested in the full garment of mind, or in the per perfectly integrated and organized mental body, into which have, has been drawn all of the experiences of the lesser bodies, so that man as mind may experience emotion, may experience growth, may experience form, and yet as mind transcend all these things and remain truly a mental being. Thus having reached this culmination, without deficiency to restrain him, without inadequacy to limit his further progress, man then has available to him the total experience of mind. Now the moment a human being achieves to the total experience of something in nature, he also achieves to a partial experience of that which is next. For mind, when completely perfected and completely integrated, is more than a totality, because out of its completeness there is another something of certain quality added. Therefore we remember the words of the artist who said, that when all things are of themselves complete, they are themselves plus completeness. And this completeness is something else. This completeness is man's capacity for a total experience. And all total experience on any level is in some ratio or symbolic sympathy to total experience per se, or in reality. Thus the total experience of Buddhi, uh, thus the, pardon me, the total experience of Manas is also the first experience of Buddhi. For the totality becomes the beginning of the next superior state. Thus, 
Only by total mind can the experience of that which transcends mind be actually achieved. Prior to that state or to that condition, man may intellectually define booty. He may dream of its existence. He may philosophically accept its reality. He may attempt to postulate its condition and even its attributes and uh, phases. But until this totality of the preceding state is achieved, he cannot experience that which is next. Thus the difference between theory and fact, between opinion and reality, uh, this difference is clearly indicated. And totality becomes, so to say, a bridge which leads the individual toward the state of Buddhic realization. Now philosophy, because it builds the mind and because each of the bodies moves from the least to the most total part of itself by ascent, and the experiencing individual passing through evolution moves from the least to the greatest experience of its own being. So in each level there is an experience which is commensurate with the experience of Bodhi, but it is on a different level. And this experience occurs in each case in the sixth level of the vehicle. Thus, mind divided into seven parts or seven levels has within its sixth level uh, what might be termed the foreshadowing of the Buddhic state, even as it has in its seventh level the foreshadowing of Atma, the true or total existence. Thus, a great philosopher or a great mystic attaining either to the sixth level of the emotional nature or the sixth level of the mental nature, will have the experience of Buddhi on that level. In other words, you will have the experience of universalization, because this is the peculiar experience of Buddhi. Universalization is the motion of the thing toward the infinite, towards a return to an unconditioned state. And in the case of man's various levels, we can perceive the workings of this even on the physical level of society. For, for instance, human society ascends on seven levels. And on the sixth level, it corresponds to the experience of Buddhi. And on the sixth level of human society, we have this experience in what we begin to dream of as the concept of one world, which on a physical plane is again the concept of unity or union. We are now experimenting intellectually and even politically for the first time seriously with the concept of the total brotherhood of mankind. We are experimenting with the idea that was so magnificently expressed in, in the rise of our own national existence, namely that all men are created free and equal. We are experiencing the experiment. As individuals, few totally believe it. Still fewer have experienced it beyond the level of a conviction. And yet what happens? We gradually perceive around us the dark mist rising as they rose around the funeral pyre of Hercules. We know that unless man achieves a universality of his own concept of civilization and culture that he is threatened with extinction. He realizes that gradually he must either discover one world or have no world. This is a symbolic expression of Buddhi on the level of social existence. Now as man gets further into the emotional world, he finds other parallels he finds the concept of universal love. He finds what uh, Jesus taught, namely that if we love or do good to those who do good to us, there is no great credit for souls to the scribes and Pharisees. 
If, however, we can do good and love those who despitefully use us, this is different. And gradually love rises from the personal, which includes first only the self, where in many cases it stops at this time, but extends onward also to love of family, to love of children. A certain type of very personal and selfish affection draws a little circle and includes within itself those small uh, numbers of persons, family, clan, brood, those that are near. Then gradually love expands to take into itself the stranger outside the gate. And by degrees man gained love of country, love of God, and the willingness to give his life, if necessary, for a devotion more than personal, more than human, and gradually tinctured with unselfishness. Thus we see the emotions reaching their buddhic level. We didn't mention the vital body, but perhaps we should pause and do so. Because here also we are moving away from the old concepts and toward the realization of total energy. We recognize more and more that vitality also ascends until we experience a common reservoir of life and that we must adjust ourselves with this reservoir or else we will perish. That unless the energies within our own bodies uh, are brought together in some relationship more important than the mere gratification of the various instincts and impulses of the moment, uh, that the individual will be sick, and that a universal life principle demands universal obedience. So even on the level of energy, as in the case of atomic energy, we are beginning to recognize energy as one thing, one tremendous force, upon which all things depend, and which by appearances may be divided, but in substance and essence is indivisible. So little by little, on every level, evolution carries us to the realization of that which is above analysis, for it is the nature of the mind to analyze or divide. And it is only in great wisdom that the mind is able to reconcile the divisions which it has fashioned itself and bring them back again to the concept of unity. So as we ascend, we come in every level to the significance of Buddha. And in the most practical and purposeful levels of our physical endeavor, we learn of the importance of unity in industry, unity in trades and professions and crafts. Trade unions are formed, associations created, in order to have mutual protective movements of all kinds. The experience that each must work with the other for the common good. And yet through all this experience constantly beating in upon him, the, the average man remains as he has always been a rugged individualist, utterly unaware that his very individuality is the cause of the various miseries with which he is so heavenly burdened at all times. So all these things are shadows of Buddha, the long shadow of the wing of the eternal. And everywhere the lesson is the same, that we must gradually outgrow division, that we must outgrow separateness. And strangely and wonderfully enough, we must outgrow this peculiar sense that strength is our own. We can no longer depend upon this rugged strength within us, this strength which is peculiarly personal. We can no longer live in a universe by will alone, battering down obstacles for the puny resources of our own natures. We have discovered that no matter how we fight or how long we struggle, we are as though struggling against a great sea which will ultimately close over us and we will leave not a rack behind. Thus, man's rugged personal desire to survive is causing him gradually to realize that as an individual, as a separate entity, as a completely isolated creature, he cannot survive. 
For isolation is death on every level, whether it is isolation of the mind, isolation of the emotions, isolation of the physical life. That which loses communion with its fellows dies. For nature has worked and is working constantly to bring things together and to uh, cause all separate natures to be reunited. And the string or thread that binds, that binds these natures together like the nosegay of Michel de Montaigne is nothing but the thread of mind. A gentle string that holds the bouquet into one pattern. The mind is not the flower, it is only the string. Thus then also in going on we come to total experience through the unfoldment and perfection of the emotional mind psychic powers of the total need of ourselves for the total experience of life. Buddhi corresponds in a mysterious way to our term light. It is the insof of the Kabbalists. For in Kabbalism uh, there was a threefold universe one part of which uh, was boundlessness, the second part boundless life, and the third boundless light. In the in Indian philosophy, Buddhi corresponds very closely to the concept of light. Not the light of the eyes, but the universal light. You remember in um, the story of the golden ass of the Furious, um, the candidate for initiation into the mysteries was taken into the grotto and in describing afterward what occurred to him he said he saw the sun shining under his feet at midnight. This is a very peculiar statement uh, but was intended to imply that the ancients were already well aware that the sun did not go out at night. That the sun did not vanish nor was it swallowed up nor did it actually descend into, the, into Hades to light the souls of the dead. It does that when it rises in the morning. The, <laughs> the sun forever shines. But uh, what we call day and night are due to the mechanical processes and the motions of the earth. Therefore, what we call light and darkness are not due to changings within space itself, but in the relationships between life and form. And while, while form imposes itself between life and light, then there is darkness. But when form no longer imposes itself, the eternal sun can be seen at midnight as easily as in the middle of the day, according to the old Greeks. This concept of Buddhi, therefore, is a kind of living light. It is the kind of light that permeates all things with the quality of making everything visible. Everything that is, is revealed in its true and natural condition. confronted with a mysterious and difficult problem and he finds the solution, he may cry out, I see the answer. I see it all now. But he is not speaking of anything that he visibly sees with his eyes. He, is, he means that he sees with his mind that some kind of light has been shed upon the inward part of himself by which things previously invisible have become visible or tangible to him. Like an idea that suddenly bursts upon him with a kind of internal rational luminosity. The light of the mind is the light by which things are seen through the reflecting power of the mental instrument. The light of the mind therefore must involve the passing of the truth through an instrument which has in the center and seat of itself the principle of ego. Thus, 
truth seen by the mind is truth censored by the ego. The immediate instinctive reaction is by the ego. What does this mean to me? How can I use it? How can I understand it? How can I apply it? How can I find some method by which my own destiny is advanced? Always everything is in the terms of I-ness or self-centeredness. The mind cannot, therefore, of its own nature and substance, actually experience the nature of truth or the nature of the light of Buddha. By its own very substance, the mind is the final barrier to the true experience. Because one of the things that Buddha knows or Buddha reveals is the fallacy of the self trying to know. Buddha, corresponding as it does to the light of the Logos, represents the spiritual faculty of universal apperception possessed by the solar deity. Uh, this faculty was described anciently as azonic. In other words, this faculty was the faculty to know, to apperceive, uh, to experience with total factuality in any place, at any time, and at all times. It has no time sequences, nor barriers, nor is its absence somewhere because it is present elsewhere. It is all-knowing, all-present, all-awareness. The light carries particularly the implication of awareness, for light cast upon a thing reveals it. Buddhi cast upon a thing reveals it. Reveals not its form or its appearance, but its absolute nature, its total being, its complete reality. To achieve this concept, to, to achieve this condition, therefore, man, according to the ancient philosophies, must change his polarity because he must move from the polarity of the earth to the polarity of the sun. And in so doing, he moves from a position of existence in time to a condition beyond time. He moves from one of the beings to the substance which sustains beings. He therefore moves from self-awareness to not self-participation in absolute awareness. As we have said, the terms are hopelessly inadequate. There is no way by which we can fully experience or describe through words that which is by its own nature and substance obviously and inevitably beyond words. So what we have is a series of symbolical illusions or accounts, stories, usually reserved to us in the sacred writings of the world. The stories which in themselves seem fabulous and incredible and might be so if literally taken. But if understood for their inner content, uh, they attempt to portray to us that which we cannot immediately understand. Buddhi in the old Kabbalistic my uh, mysteries was called the Merkava, or the Chariot of Righteousness. It is the mysterious chariot described in the vision of Ezekiel that is filled with eyes and of wheels, and in the midst of which rides the mysterious white-robed figure of the Logos. In, mis in Muslim mystics, uh, mysticism, the Merkava is the prayer rug, the mat upon which the mystic leans and uh, kneels, and which is the symbol of the temple. In the ancient Jewish rituals, according to the great assembly, the temple of Solomon was the Merkava, or the miniature of the temple in heaven, the temple of righteousness. And in all of these analogies, we have some references or intimations of the nature of this mysterious power, the great Buddhi illuminating agent, which is also referred to in the old writings as the Archangel Michael, 
the secret God of Israel. This mysterious luminous power which overthrows the hosts of darkness, this psychopompus of the army of the Lord, who cast down Satan and his legions for self-pride, represents the struggle between universal soul and mind. The struggle of mind to usurp the power of soul. Not now human soul or mortal soul, but the world soul. The mysterious soul of God, which is the blight of Buddha. This soul, of course, is also the grace, the mysterious medicine of the wise. It is the emblem of the healing of all things, for that which achieves to it neither hungers nor thirsts, and the God of it neither slumbers nor sleeps. It is thus pure light as pure truth, and it fills all space. And it is this, the end of the quest, the mysterious search of man for the state of substantial spiritual reality. To achieve to Buddha, then, is to achieve to this state of transcendent union with the pure principle of universal light. Now, when this, period, this principle is experienced, even as the fringe of its vestment passes across the soul of man. The passing even experience of this, therefore, is entirely different and almost completely reverse of the experience of mind. Truth is not known by cognition, as we know this term. It is not something which is accepted by the reason nor is it the object directly of the adoration of the heart. The knowledge of it, the apperception of it, the capacity to experience it involve faculties that man does not at the present time know that he possesses, although under certain and exceptional circumstances he may have flashes or momentary participations in the fringe of this state of existence. If man, then, is in the presence of an instrument of cognition by which the pure substance of essential light not light as color not light as visible luminosity but light as the complete revelation of the substance of things to achieve this what is man's appropriate faculty how can man do this according to the Hindus it is necessary to study a little bit of cosmogony in order to understand this point more clearly. Man's mental existence, the monastic, monastic principle with which he functions, is something uh, which was not essentially, originally, part of his own nature. Had man been mind-born truly, and could he ascend by substance and essence no more than mind? He could never escape, for man could never create an existence superior to his own totality. But according to all the great religions, man was not born of manas. Man was a spirit, a divine being, created in the substance of the first logos, and thereby composed of an eternal substance. Thus man possesses in potency, and even today we recognize vestiges of it, the capacity for a spiritual existence. He has bartered this birthright for a bowl of pottage, but at the same time he could not lose that which the gods had given. Thus man by nature is destined and foreordained to pass into the state of Buddha and to return to the mysterious land from which he came, the eternal substance of space. Therefore, it is not uh, that he must fashion some mysterious agent 
that he must create some mechanical horse like the one in the story of the Arabian Nights which carried the magician but which was dissolved and disintegrated by the power of the adept. This building of the mechanical horse that will fly in the sky is not the answer to the mystery of Buddha any more than the creation of greater flying machines and things of that nature can actually mean the conquest of space. Space cannot be conquered except inside of man. He will go on and on until devices fail him ultimately, but he will still not come to the extremity of space. But he can reach that extremity within himself in an amazing and mysterious manner. So the problem of Buddha is just simply based upon one great concept. Buddha is always there. The light of truth never fails in this world. It is everywhere in everything. And it is the monastic principle of mind that stands as a wall or as a block. It is opinion or sense that blocks the way of illumination. There is no darkness in the world except the darkness which is in man himself. Therefore, the relief of this situation does not actually mean that man must build a Buddhic body because that body is the temple and it belongs to the gods and it is said of the ancient of ancients, my tabernacle is in the sun. The sun itself is the great house, the great shrine, and the great tabernacle, and the eternal temple. And man, above the principle of mind, is a worshiper in this house and has no other body required. So when the time comes, as in the story of the Bodhisattva, or the soul on the threshold of illumination, it is not that man builds a body because he cannot create an instrument that can limit, bind, or inhibit the universal motion of light. He can never say, my light or your light. He can never fashion a house for himself out of that which by its own nature is universal and indivisible. He can never subdivide the sphere of light and create a little homestead here and there for himself. He can do these things in the world of matter up to the level of mind, but he cannot on the Buddhic level. Then the answer is the same as it has always been and the Eastern mystic has long traversed the path of union. And that is that the only way in which Buddhi can be known is by the gradual reduction of that which is not Buddhi. As the darkness is taken from the window pane, the light shines through. You add nothing. You take away that which is not so. And that which remains when all error is removed is truth. It neither requires defense nor support. It cannot conquer, nor can it be conquered. And man cannot wrestle with it as Jacob wrestled with the angel. The actual problem is always the same. Namely, that man achieves Buddha by the elimination of the vortex or focus of self-awareness. Because that which is universal cannot function through that which is not universal. It may be present, and it may, through certain of its attributes and forces, enlighten and vitalize the lower vehicles of man, and Buddha does. But it can never blaze forth in its sovereign splendor until man himself removes the obstacle. And the obstacle from the beginning of time, the stumbling block unto the flesh, is selfhood, man's sense of his own identity. As long as he is himself, he hopes he will be nothing less, but he has not learned that he can be nothing more. 
and that is his limitation. In sacrificing that which is less, he has set a standard, his own selfhood, and in keeping that standard, he is forced to die defending it. Buddhi increases or becomes knowable or cognizable to the human being to the degree that that which is less than Buddhi no longer dominates the compound. While the individual says, mine or thine, that which is superior to mine or thine has no possibility of manifestation. And Buddhi is superior. While the individual says, I live and I die, eternity has no opportunity of expressing itself. While the individual says, this is good and this is bad, reality cannot be manifested. Thus all these qualifications which arise in mind are through philosophy, which is the final tincturing of the mind with its own total capacity, and these are gradually resolved. It is said that the wise man does not fear death, nor poverty, nor shame, because as long as he is true to himself, he can live with a good hope. It is therefore a step in this direction. But the most difficult step of all is for the wise man to get over his own wisdom. This is the impossible step unless in the very accumulation of wisdom the truly wise man has realized both its advantages and its limitations and is able therefore to use its advantages and also when the moment arises transcend its limitations self-attachment, like the addiction to any belief, leaves the individual deprived of other beliefs and other attachments. The moment we possess, we lose participation in the universal. The moment we hate one, we lose the sense of universal love. Thus every universal thing is destroyed by particular things, and every universal thing is revealed as man gradually releases himself from the dogmatism of particulars. Buddhi then remains as a great sea or a mysterious, um, unlimited ocean of light into which man casts himself by the voluntary extinction of his own personality, of his own personal requirements and desires. The old neophyte entering the temple was asked what he sought, and his answer was light. This light is Buddhi. This is the light of the world. This is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This is the Logos, the Redeemer. And none shall enter or approach the Father, Atma, except through the Son, which is Buddhi. This is therefore the universal Christ, which if it be lifted up, to draw all things unto it. This uh, concept therefore leads inevitably and naturally to man's only possible approach to the mystery which is not loaded and burdened with his own arrogance. Anyone who would seek to enter the sheepfold except by the proper door the same as a thief and a robber and the sheepfold which represents the sphere of Buddha or the sphere of the redeemed must be entered only by the proper door. And it is the same door that stands at the end of Buddha's noble eightfold path. It is the door of the peculiar and mysterious ultimate sacrifice of man, uh, the relinquishing of the principle of intellectual selfhood. The mind must die like Moses on the hill of Moab, for it cannot enter into the promised land. So wisdom dies. But the great sage, like Socrates, voluntarily chose death before dishonor. And in complete wisdom, man chooses the death of the mind 
in order that he may fulfill the will of the Spirit. And this is, of course, a kind of crucifixion upon the brow of a hill. And this is where, in the great involutionary cycle, the universal light died for man. And in the great evolutionary cycle, man redeems universal light, which is resurrected through his own renunciation. Buddha, in this way, is approached by the gradual elimination of that which is less, that which is not worthy, that which is restriction or limitation. And in the Buddhistic philosophy, the final expiation of the karma of, of the cycle of necessity means the absolute transcending of cause and effect through the perfect suspension of the mental principle, which creating no more illusion, which no longer and for no further reason uh, sustaining or continuing the processes of division leaves the individual with no further negative responsibilities upon his destiny. The various mystics have explained this also in the best words that they had available. In the concept of the being, the mind, going to sleep in God, of the uh, concept of the complete renunciation of the self, that in the presence of God there is not a humbleness or a grovelingness, but a very simple and direct acceptance of destiny, the acceptance of the inevitability of the person ceasing and the border of the divine. For man is of the divine. It is his substance and his nature. And as he returns to deity according to the Eastern life way, he does not become another god in heaven. He becomes God forever. There is but one universal principle. Evolution does not cause more of these principles. It gathers back the sparks to the flame and the one principle continues. But that one principle, having passed through the great cycle of necessity, brings home to itself all the creatures that originally came forth from it as sparks from the anvil. In this sense, then, we can appreciate the idea uh, that Buddha tells about and says, whence is the flame when it goes out? What happens to the fire when it goes out? Does it cease? What happens to it when it springs up elsewhere? Is it the same fire or is it a different fire? Everywhere that stone and steel meet, there is a spark. And yet every one of these sparks can go out and the darkness and the night can extend over vast infinities of land and sky. But the flame that goes out is the mind that goes to sleep in Buddha. Now in Samadhi, the Eastern mystic approaches this, but of course if he actually obtains it, he cannot return, because once the thread between the personal and the universal is broken, once man returns to the universal, he cannot again create the illusion of separateness. Why? Because an illusion, in order to bind him, must seem real to him. He can never suffer from an illusion he does not accept. He cannot say, yes, I think, I, I think I'll have an illusion this morning and we'll do accordingly. The only power that illusion has is that the person suffering from it is unable to extricate himself from it. If he was not captured by it, it could not limit him. Thus, according to Buddha, when the mind has actually achieved the reality, it can never again lose it. When the consciousness has gone on to identity with absolute truth, it is impossible for that consciousness ever again to believe in the illusion of its own individual existence. Because it cannot believe it, it cannot cause it. And because it cannot cause it, it cannot be reborn. 
it cannot again make the mistakes which constitute the cycle which holds it to illusion. It cannot go on being born and dying once it has experienced immortality. This, of course, is the burden in a strange but rather interesting way of O'Neill's play, Lazarus Laughed. Lazarus, having died and been raised from the dead, was free from the power of the Roman Empire because all that Tiberius could do to frighten him was to sentence him to death. The man who had died and gone through death could not be frightened. Thus also any state that is outgrown by consciousness can never again bind that consciousness. This is in contradistinction to our popular belief that we have relapses. <laughs> Nearly everyone says, I know better than I do, and I uh, didn't do quite so well today, but I'll do better tomorrow. This is actually not true. We all have thoughts that are better than our practices, but we do what we know. Sometimes we wish we didn't. But the fact that we energize by factual action, an illusion or a mistake, indicates that we are not master of that illusion or of that mistake. We have not transcended it, or it could not catch us even in an off moment. Thus in the story of Buddhi, the actual experience of it automatically terminates. The possibility of relapse Obviously, the being that attains it has passed beyond the possibility of relapse. But once this condition has been attained, a lesser condition can never capture the consciousness. Thus, the story of the Bodhisattva is, of course, typical. In the uh, Mahayana school of Northern Buddhism, some of the bodhisattvas are those who are standing upon the threshold of the great release. Pause to consider the possibility of either going on uh, to that which is eternal, or else to come back and become ministers to the needs of their fellow men. And if the uh, bodhisattva makes the great, great renunciation, and returns as the world teacher, or as a great saint, or sage, or arhat. He must do so by preserving one thread of his ancient karma. He must still have an illusion. There must be one mystery that he has not solved. There must be one renunciation that he has not made. Otherwise he cannot come back. Therefore the Bodhisattva is on the verge of perfection but he keeps one ancient fault in order that he may still mingle with men and believe it otherwise he cannot do so I think however that the somewhat prevalent opinion that we are all voluntarily holding on to one fault for that reason is somewhat <laughs> exaggerated I didn't take it too serious <laughs> Buddha tells us the same thing uh, that through the long years of his ministry he was paying the karma and that finally under the sala tree where he entered the nirvana he committed or performed the last act of karma he paid his last debt and in so doing broke the cord that bound him to illusion for that reason it is said that he entered the Mahapara nirvana but only after he had given 700 lives to the teaching of his fellow men. This is the burden of the Jataka, the great stories of the birth tales of the Buddha, recounting his services to mankind through numerous embodiments, but always with the thread of imperfection left unbroken in order that he might return. Thus man may attain to a very great degree of insight, but what is the thread that must remain unbroken? The final, ultimate, and last thread of all, the last spark of self-identity. Only because he is a self-identified being can the Bodhisattva resolve to come back. Only because he preserves the thread of self-determinism 
can he teach? Can he say, I am a teacher? Or can he presume or assume to serve his fellow men? Only to that point. And when that final moment comes and the work is finished, the final renunciation of the sense of identity terminates the conditioned life of the creature uh, that has integrated in the sphere of mind and now ascends into the buddhic mystery. What is the state of man in buddhi? This is something uh, that has been often asked because in the eastern tradition certainly there is a small stream of souls passing into buddhi very slowly, very few but through the ages some have gone on and such is the account of them that we have in the sacred writings of all people there are souls that have returned to their own far distant native land what then is the state of them? I think Buddha gives us some hint of it. I think in the Christian mystery there is also a very definite hint of it. Buddha tells his disciples that he will be with them forever. And Christ tells his disciples, Lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. The Buddhist metaphysics and the Hindu also point out that one of the attributes of buddhi is omnipresence. In other words, that which becomes one with the universal light sacrifices a conditioned existence in time and place for an eternal abidance in light. That in some way the great ones who have gone home live on forever in light not visible light but the light of the soul and they who taught men from the light of their minds and their hearts so that men gather about them as they gathered at the feet of Buddha or Jesus receive the light of the teacher from without but after the uh, illumination or the tremendous achievement of the freedom in Buddhi, the life and the light of the teacher flows in the world, coming through the world. And as the Mahayanists also point out, the seed of Buddha is planted in every soul that exists in space as part of the omnipotence and the great illumined ones become the ever strengthening power of release within the souls of men strengthening the resolution the will and the determination to make the great achievement so that those who came first to men ultimately come through men as part of the great life life of the soul of the world thus we find in eastern images the innumerable rays of the solar disk each terminating in one of the meditating forms of the Buddha the light of the world like the mysterious loving hands upon the solar disk of Akhenaten in Egypt hands forever raising hands from the universality of things so that the, the good mind and the good teacher lives or live on forever in the simple goodness of the light. Thus Buddha and the Hindus also tell us that no man is good. Jesus says the same thing, only the Father is good. Therefore man does not in the Buddha achieve to a state of being good. He achieves real, real reunion with goodness. He is not good, he is goodness. He returns to the universal fact he becomes part of the power which he has sought to emulate. He has tried to be good because goodness exists. And he ascends from trying to be good to reunion with the ever-existent goodness itself. Therefore, in the Hindu, man does not become a god, he becomes god. 
he becomes not another deity in a firmament of gods. He becomes one with the eternal Atma, the being that is, was, and ever shall be. And beyond Buddhi, which is this strange and exalted sheath of over-consciousness, lies the great silence, the Sabbath of the Lord, which is Atma itself. Atma, that which transcends the beautiful and the good, that which finally in its total existence is being itself, going on forever in the pure quality of its own nature. For as Buddhi is light, or the saving power of being, so being itself is life, the moving power behind light and existence. Life forever. Life sustaining, maintaining, unfolding all things, but remaining itself forever the hidden and recondite root of existence. Of this even the greatest sages have had nothing to say other than that it is, that it ever shall be, and that its firstborn is light, and that by this light all men who come into the world receive the right of emancipation, the right to go home to the light, to be one with it, by first practicing its ways and finally achieving identity with its substance. If then we can understand the light of Buddha in a little different term than our familiar way of light, we can also say that as a man entering a dark room turns on the light and suddenly sees every part of that room. So man of mind, living in the darkness of his own intellectual limitation, receiving into himself the light of Buddha, suddenly becomes aware in all parts of his nature and being of the total mystery, the total meaning, the total purpose of existence. Until then he hopes, believes, and fears. He sees us through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And in this mysterious and wonderful experience, which is prefigured and foretold by the visions and dreams of the saints and mystics, and by the subtle experiences within man himself, something of the coming destiny is foretold to him. Something becomes mystically knowable by him. And in this way, he is lured on as the moth to the flame. He goes on to the light because in his own nature it is his destiny. He cannot escape it. But in his final act of acceptance, he must make the voluntary sacrifice of that which is not light. And this is the hardest thing we have to do everywhere in the world. Love is not merely affection. It is the voluntary relinquishment of hate. Truth is not only uh, knowledge. It is the total relinquishment of error. And that which remains always, when that which is not so is removed, is that which is eternally true. So man is forever moving veils from his face, and he is learning to recognize that the error is in him, and that the only place it was born was in him, and the only place that it can die is in him. And that if he would achieve the great light, he must follow the instructions of the Gita, where he must take the sword of quick detachment and cut low the snaky branches of the tree of mind. This is the mystical discipline. Now there are some who feel, quite rightly at this stage of things, that if they should give up this selfness, this individuality, that they would give up everything they have. And that would be true at this stage. And it is part of the mystery of Buddhi that every step of its achievement is voluntary. The individual is never for one moment required to make a formal decision in which he is torn between truth and error. Such formal decisions rise in the emotions or in the mind only. 
And wherever they exist, they bear witness to the failure of the achievement, the conquest of the standard or limiting instrument. Therefore, before man is able to reach the possibility of Buddhi, he has already ceased to desire anything else. And while his desire for selfhood remains, he is perfectly safe, and just as unsafe as selfhood forces him to be. As long as he believes firmly that he can conquer the universe with his own will, that he can become the total autocrat of his destiny, that ultimately even the gods will bow before him, he is perfectly privileged to go on that way, and he will have all the vicissitudes, mostly bad, which are associated with this concept, which is little better than a complex. But as Buddha pointed out, selfhood is a disease almost incurable. <laughs> it is the sovereign malady of ignorance. And as man wishes to be sick, he will be sick. And as long as he can endure the sickness, he will have it. And he is not ready for anything better until he realizes fully and completely the inadequacy of what he is. Until then, it is up to him to live his life, fight his way, pay his debts. And he will do so. But there will come a time when man's desire to be himself is exhausted. And at that time, his desire to go home, his desire to return to the eternal life of which he is part, will be stronger than his resolution to continue as a crippled creature in a darkened sphere. When this desire becomes sufficiently strong, he will go home. But no one will force it. Nothing in nature will require it. Nature will have its quiet, simple, prodding way. It will never say anything to him, but it will never give him peace until he achieves the end. That is the very quiet way in which the universe moves all things to its own appointed ends. And the appointed end of man is that he shall have a universal consciousness. And rather than to limit himself by self-mindedness, that he shall again know his kinship with God, and know that like the saviors also, he is a son of the eternal, that he too must come into his inheritance, and that this inheritance is God-knowing and God-vision. And to achieve this, he grows and prepares himself, and in the end he creates the bridge that leads him to the Buddhic plain, where he is at last upon the steps of his father's house, where he is beginning to know and contemplate the effulgent source of light and the magnificent blossoms that hang pendant from the eternal heaven. This Neoplatonism also beautifully brought out, for in its great theurgic disciplines, it taught that man returns to a universal state which he cannot describe but which is accompanied by the perfect light of his soul that he becomes inwardly and outwardly luminous that in all things he participates in the all-knowing of God beyond this definition cannot go but this is the bridge which must be formed and this is the end of the chain of vehicles that man shall transcend bodies and enter into the body of God, which becomes his proper and inevitable vestment. And this is the body which, as Pythagoras of Crotona said, deity is an immense and eternal being whose body is composed of the substance of light and whose soul is composed of the substance of truth. A man experiencing upwardly comes finally to this transcendent being, changing his own body for the body of God. Actually, of course, all bodies are bodies 
provided by the mysterious workings of the universal and divine forces. But the buddhic body is the body of God consciously inhabited and is the magnificent wedding garment which the soul shall wear at the feast of the bridegroom. This uh, mystery then gives us perhaps some concept of Buddha, as best we can do it. We hope that it will help you, and we hope that it will round out and complete our study of the bodies of man.